Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet Second Class Kayla Steiner. Welcome to this session of the 28th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium, made possible by our leadership keynote lecture sponsor, the Class of 1959. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, SEAC retired John Troxell. SEAC Troxell is a retired United States Army senior non-commissioned officer who served as the third senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In this capacity, he served as the principal advisor to the chairman and the secretary of defense on all matters related to the troops of the U.S. Armed Forces. This position made Siak Troxel the most senior enlisted member of the Armed Forces. After his 37 years in the military, Siak Troxel opened his own consulting firm and now serves as a brand ambassador for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Hiring Our Heroes Foundation, the Veterans Leading Group, and Eyewear Safety Systems. He serves as the Vice President for Strategic Planning for Defend USA and the Military Consultant for Alpha Warrior 360 Gyms and the Film 45 Movie Production Company. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to present to you SEAC retired John Troxell. Uh, good morning, everybody, and to Cadet Steiner, thank you so much uh, for that warm welcome. It's truly an honor for me to be here today to be a part of the Air Force Academy's National Character and Leadership Symposium. What I wanna to talk to you all today about is what I like to call in our military profession and those that are currently living the warrior ethos, uh, preparing for the worst day of your life, whether that's in combat or in everyday life, but certainly uh, the worst days of our lives can come in combat. And I wanna start by shaping the operational environment that we find ourselves operating in today and uh, for the foreseeable future. Our national defense strategy, our guiding document for how we as the Department of Defense operate uh, outlines a two plus three kind of threat in, in terms of adversaries. And it's built around that we know we live in an era of great power competition, but we also have to respond to crisis, and certainly we have to be able to fight and win in conflict. And when we talk about great power competitors, we're talking about nations like China and Russia, who uh, below the threshold of conf conflict have done malign activity and provocative kind of things uh, in for China in the South China Sea and pursuing uh, events outside the second island chain in the Pacific, but also with their Belt Road Initiative to continue to be a global presence. And on any given day, you can see China operating both diplomatically, economically, and militarily in continents of Africa and South America, and not just uh, routinely in the Pacific. And for Russia, the Russian adventurism that started really with the uh, annexation of Crimea from the Ukraine, and now continues uh, in its efforts to splinter NATO uh, to further their gains, but also their presence in the Middle East, as well as their presence in Africa and South America shows that the Russians are also a great power competitor that we are gonna have to compete with. But we're gonna have to respond to crisis. And although these competitors are near peer kind of threats that will certainly uh, uh, do things that could cause us to end up in another uh, world war. Um, really, the crisis that we think will come, it comes from nations like North Korea and Iran, with the North Koreans, what they're doing to continue to pursue nuclear capability, and that can range uh, the western part of the United States, and with Iran continuing to be a threat, not only in the Middle East, uh, but a global player because of their ability to be the state sponsor, the number one state sponsor of terrorism around the world. Uh, their in investments in their missile force, as well as uh, the disruptive activity that they use through their proxy forces in places like Yemen, Lebanon, and then certainly uh, throughout the uh, Persian Gulf and the Arabian Gulf. And then when we talk about fighting and winning, that is not necessarily fighting and winning against uh, these long-term power competitors or these rogue nations, but also uh, the threat of terrorism. And although it may be nascent now uh, during the coronavirus here, let there be no doubt that people like ISIS, 
Al Qaeda and like organizations like that will continue to pursue their brand of radical ideology and continue to attempt to conduct attacks not only in Western Europe and other places, but also ultimately back in North America and the United States. So what does that mean, especially when it comes to potential near peer kind of conflict that uh, our forces may see? Well, certainly um, a rise in air to air combat uh, will be a reality. A rise in surface to air missile threats will be a reality, as well as a rise in infrastructure and convoy threats uh, throughout the uh, operating space that we're operating in. And let there be no doubt, this will be a multi-domain conflict, not only in our traditional war fighting areas of air, ground, and sea, but certainly in cyber, in space, and in our, the nuclear domain, uh, we'll be fighting as well. So what does that mean to the men and women that have to serve uh, every day in uniform? Well, we have to make sure that the men and women in uniform are prepared for the worst day of their life. On any given day, they could be asked to deploy and do any of number of things. Certainly in a long-term power competition, it, it will include uh, exercises around the world that get after not only building readiness within the US military, but also that of our partners and allies and showing uh, these uh, competitors like Russia and China that there is a strength within uh, us and our partners and allies that will not be broken by their malign activities. So preparing for the worst day of your life means it starts every day with what you can do. And I have a phrase that I've used ever since I was a striker brigade command sergeant major during the surge in Iraq in 2007 and eight, as we were getting after the insidious uh, forefathers of the current uh, ISIS, this being Al Qaeda in, in uh, Iraq. And it's called PME hard. That means in order to be best prepared for the conditions we face on the worst day of our lives, we have to be physically, mentally, and emotionally hard, not just tough, but hard. And the true definition of hard is the exact opposite of soft, and it's not easily penetrable by any of the conditions that you can face in conflict. So how do we get after that, this concept of being PME hard? I think it starts every day with a leader uh, taking their formation or their span of control and making sure that physically they are best prepared for the worst day of their life. That means we've got to have hard fitness sessions that build on the fitness and wellness and individual readiness of every airman, soldier, sailor, Marine, or Coast Guardsman. And we all know that a great foundation physically will uh, be an enabler and a catalyst to being better mentally and emotionally for conflict. And then we have to be continue to pursue, continue to pursue excellence in our technical and tactical aspects of our duty. The idea is that we get at peak operating efficiency and performance, because certainly our adversaries will be doing the same thing. And that means things like sets and reps on battle drills or emergency procedures or the standard operating procedures on how we operate. And remember this, regardless of what job someone has in the United States military and certainly in the United States Air Force, first and foremost, they have to be able to defend themselves and the men and women on their left and right and be able to defeat a threat. We do have a certain set in the Air Force that we call battlefield airmen, but from John Wayne Troxell's perspective, in order to be best prepared for the worst day of our lives, every airman in the Air Force has to think and act like a battlefield airman in terms of how they use their weapon systems, how they execute emergency procedures, and how they do battle drills when they come under attack. Because let there be no doubt, if it's a, a fight on the North Korean Peninsula, Although it may be a pursuit going north to take over Pyongyang and defeat the North Koreans, the North Koreans are well known for their attacks in rear areas, and especially where there may be non-contiguous battle space and things like that. And certainly the Iranians 
who are masters at this unconventional kind of warfare, it'll be the same way. So we cannot have that attitude that I am a logistician or I'm, not, I'm an administrative uh, service member, so I don't really have to worry about uh, seeing the enemy in conflict. That kind of thinking on the worst day of our lives will get people unnecessarily killed. So we have to realize that first and foremost, we are a warrior in the greatest military in the world. Now I wanna give you an example. You know, maybe it was an epiphany for me about my worst day of my life. And that was the July the 19th, 2007, when I was a striker brigade command sergeant major in Iraq in the Northern Baghdad belt. It was about a hundred days into our deployment and we had already lost over 15 men and women who were killed in action and had over 200 severely wounded. And on that day that I, I classify as my worst day of my life, my patrol was hit by an Iranian explosive form penetrator utilized by Shia militia groups. It killed Corporal Brandon Craig, my radio operator and personal security uh, detail and severely wounded my fire support officer, Danny Dudek, as well as others that were slightly wounded. And as we were repelling this threat and I was assisting our medic on the scene with treating Danny Dudek, um, I was concerned because the 130 degree heat with uh, over 100 pounds of kit, that if this was gonna be a sustained fight, it was gonna be pretty brutal. And then as the uh, medevac helicopter came in so that we could extract Danny Dudek, uh, it landed about 300 meters away from where we were kind of holed up and uh, defending ourselves. And as I tasked two other non-commissioned officers to come with me and the medic, as well as the flight medic off the helicopter to take Dudek to the, hel to the uh, medevac, as we continued to move under fire, I started to notice that some of these non-commissioned officers were succumbing to the heat. And even the flight medic was beginning to succumb to the heat to the point we had to put the stretcher down about hundred meters from the helicopter. And I had to task others to come and help us get there. And as we finally got Dudek on that helicopter and got him out of there and we, can, and we ended up uh, eliminating the threat to us, I realized in that point in time that I as a leader as much as I had prepared myself for the worst day of my life, that I had not held my subordinates to the same standard that I held myself. And it played out on the worst day of our life in combat where we needed to get a wounded troop off of the battlefield and be able to repel a threat. And so from that day forward, I told myself that I will continue to hold myself to a high standard but I will continue to hold those around me to the same standard I expect out of myself as a leader. Because let there be no doubt, the worst day of your life could be a, a routine kind of day that you think is just going like normal and all of a sudden it just goes bad in a hurry. And between multiple combat missions that will happen, certainly in a near peer kind of fight, but also in a uh, sustain and uh, support mission in order to assist partner forces against terrorism or whatever it is, that a routine patrol is never routine. A routine mission is never routine. We have to take every mission like it will be the last mission we do on the worst day of our life. And I will tell you that I learned from that. And I learned that uh, there's two things you can be after something bad happens to you like that. You can be a victim of the circumstance and blame yourselves or potentially blame others for what happened to you that day and certainly blame the enemy or you can become a champion and you can say the enemy got us today. The enemy will always get a vote regardless of how prepared we are. But being a champion means that I am going to take on what happened to us and I am gonna work my butt off as a leader and I'm gonna train my subordinates so that we are better prepared than we were the day that we got hit the worst 
and continue to grow and develop. So not only that, that we, will we continue to inspire our future combat action, but potentially intimidate any enemy action against us. Hey, we live in a hypersensitive world right now, in my opinion. And there's people that are easily disgruntled. And, uh, and there's leaders that will uh, feel sorry for these disgruntled people and will become self-deprecating. But in the end, I will tell you this, as a leader, if we have people that uh, are not doing things right or they are disgruntled because they didn't get a promotion or something like that, certainly we have to be compassionate in what may have happened to them and uh, be responsive to them and assist them in continuing to be an effective member of the team but we certainly cannot allow there to be an imbalance between compassion and discipline, especially when it comes to a combat zone. So my message today to leaders is always be a champion and don't, do not be a victim because the minute you allow victimism to creep into your formation, it will have effects on morale, it will have effects on performance, and in the end, it will have effects on what the enemy can do to you. Now, I will leave you with three things that I think a leader needs to be, especially when it comes to being best prepared for the worst day of your life. One that has to be presence. In everything the organization does or the service members that you're responsible for do, you have to be present. Your presence as a leader will send volumes to the people that you lead, especially when it comes to sharing in the same hardships that they're doing. If they have to live in squalor because of where we're deployed at or where the mission takes uh, our forces to, then the leader better be there with them sharing in those hardships. Second, you have to be persistent as a leader. Deployments are long, especially in combat. And every day you have to be prepared for that worst day of your life. So that means you can never take shortcuts when it comes to pre-combat checks, pre-combat inspections. And when it comes to something that can end up being a tragedy, like potentially an aircraft that uh, could fall out of the sky for whatever reason, let alone to enemy fire, then we better start micromanaging those kinds of things that will allow that aircraft to be best prepared for it to get after. We don't certainly, we, we don't necessarily have to micromanage people, but when it comes to resources or missions that are, could end up in catastrophe, certainly leaders' persistence in making sure the organization is best prepared is paramount. And the last thing is performance. Just because you're a leader doesn't mean that you have to go around saying, do as I tell you to do. The best and most effective leaders will say, watch me, follow me, and do what I do. And a leader that leads through their personal example will gain the respect, will regain, uh, will gain the respect, will gain uh, the morale of the troops that will rally around them on that worst day. So be present, be persistent, and perform. Last but not least, I want to leave you with a, an inspirational uh, kind of something that I did one time. I tell leaders all the time, you got to be bold, but you got to be professional. Being bold means you're not afraid to say what's on your mind, especially if something's wrong. But you got to be professional about it and you got to be tactful. And a few years ago, when I was the SEAC, I was a little concerned in Washington, D.C., uh, not just in the Eisenhower building of the, of the White House complex, but on Capitol Hill with the State Department, and even in some areas of the Department of Defense, I was concerned that we were getting a little complacent with what we were doing to take the fight to ISIS. And I thought that in Washington, D.C., that we were forgetting that men and women were still fighting and that we were still losing service members in places like Africa, in the Middle East and other places. And 
when Secretary of Defense Mattis took over as the Secretary of Defense and he put into his uh, vocabulary, we're going to use the word annihilate, not just defeat our enemies. We are going to annihilate them. And that means that violence of action and taking the fight to the enemy and understand that we are warriors every day in the United States military and we've got to be aggressive in our approach and striving for excellence in everything we did. It just set off our, our DOD in a direction that we needed to go. And so as I saw how we were approaching ISIS, the threats and everything, and, uh, and, and what was going on around the world, I finally called out ISIS in a forum uh, with Secretary Mattis. And I told them that uh, they have two options. They can surrender or die. We're a peace-loving people, ladies and gentlemen, and, uh, and a peace-loving nation. If our enemies, like ISIS, surrender, we will treat them with dignity and respect. We will safeguard them to their detainee holding facility cell. We will provide them food, a place to sleep, shelter, and above all else, we will uh, provide them due process for their war crimes. But let there be no doubt, and this not only goes to ISIS, but uh, any of those long-term power competitors or the rogue nations that we may have to face in combat, if they come up against the United States, our allies and partners, and they choose not to surrender, then we will kill them. And we'll kill them with extreme prejudice. Whether that is dropping bombs on them from the greatest air force on the planet, shooting them with our precision weapon systems or area weapon systems, or if need be, and if all else fails, we will beat them to death with our entrenching tools, our military shovels. But in the end, any enemy, especially ISIS, that comes up against the United States of America and our partners and allies has to understand that it will be non-negotiable and you can either surrender or die. And as I put that message out, I did it to inspire the troops, but I didn't realize the impact it would have on the troops around the world, but also how it, some took offense to my message in Washington, DC. But in the end, the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman, General Joe Dunford, told me, keep saying that because the troops need to hear that. My message was bold, but it was professional. And it basically built down what we are when we live a warrior ethos. So thank you all once again for having me today. It is truly an honor to be here. And as a retiree and a veteran, I love saying this now to every man and woman that serves in the United States military now, today, whether you're active guard or reserve, thank you for defending my freedom, my family's freedom, and the freedom of 300 million Americans around the world. You belong to the greatest military in the world and our freedom, our homeland, and our way of life will never be in question or be threatened as long as we have great men and women like you all that are serving today that, have say, that will say, not on my watch will I allow any enemy to infringe on our way of life and our freedoms. God bless you all. Thank you all. And I look forward to your questions. Siak Troxel, thank you so much for your inspiring words today. We will now begin our question and answer portion of the event. We ask that you ask questions for Siak Troxel using the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I will then present your questions as they come in. The first question from the audience is, what are your thoughts on the, on the importance as leaders to ensure that we develop our forces to understand the importance to operate as a joint force? I think it's paramount. I think... Uh... Um, for cadets like you, Cadet Steiner, and those that are uh, getting ready to graduate and move out into the Air Force, as well as our enlisted force, we need, first and foremost, I believe that we need to make uh, professionals in their, their, their parent service first, meaning that I think at about, in the enlisted ranks, at about the E5 rank, we need to start exposing our enlisted folks to the joint environment. We need them to be practicing professionals and experts in their basic skills, which could take them through their recruit training 
their advanced training and then into their first duty station. But I think as early as possible, we need to expose them to what it means to be a joint warfighter. And certainly for officers, I think we can start at their lieutenant rank and continue to expose them what it means to be a joint, uh, to be a member of a joint force. Because let there be no doubt, we will never go back to fighting in stovepipes, potentially like we did during Desert Storm when I served there, or pre 9-11. The world is different now, the threats are different now. We will always fight as a joint and multinational force in future conflicts. So it's imperative that we continue to grow joint war fighters. Don't let, don't, don't take this wrong or don't be mistaken in this. Everybody needs to have service identity, whether it's an airman, a space force, a Marine, soldier, whatever it is, their service identity is important and they have to be a master at their basic skills within their service. But to be, to promote maximum effectiveness and efficiency, we have to develop joint war fighters sooner, not later. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts on that, sir. Um, another member of the audience has asked, what is the importance of diversity in our profession of arms and in relation to warrior ethos? Diversity is what makes up our military. Um, if we have everybody in our military who looks alike, who comes from the same background and same culture, who acts alike, thinks alike, we will have group think and we will have gaps and seams within our force. We have to leverage what makes America great and that's our, our, our diversity. And we have to be inclusive in everything we do. And for a leader, that means you have to know your people. And as we talk through the DOD right now about people first, that means you have to know the people. Where do they come from? What is their cultural background? What is important to them? And in the end, that diversity bound by that single uniform that we all may wear or that joint uniform that we all may wear will make us most effective. And we have to continue to look at talent and manage talent based on how effective they are, not so much on how they look or how they act. We have to be inclusive in everything we do. And that is our greatest strength in our military is when we empower and are inclusive in everything we do and we put diversity at the forefront. Another member asked, uh, sir, how do you work with subordinates who don't respond to your hard military leadership style? <laughs> well, I, uh, I don't know that it's hard, but I, um, I try to be inspiring in everything I do. Here's one thing I know. If, we, if, if a leader is ethical, moral, is, is legal, moral, and ethical in everything they do, and they're inspirational in their approach, and they're leading through their example, uh, whatever they expect their subordinates to do, they're doing it and they're demonstrating it. I don't know that that's hard leadership. I think that is uh, showing people this is what right looks like. And if, uh, and if a subordinate takes offense to the leader demonstrating what they expect out of them, then in my opinion, I think the subordinate is the one that has the challenges. But I think if that's the situation, then the leader has a responsibility to influence those subordinates that this is the way we need to be. One thing that we don't do enough of is have discussions on what the worst day of our life could look like in combat. And I will tell you that uh, after that deployment where I had my worst day, I had 54 men and women that were killed in action and I had over 500 severely wounded. And to this day, I carry cards around with me with their names on them so that I never forget. And even for 14 years after that, as I continued to move up, I wanted to make sure that I as a leader was growing every day and getting better. And if I'm growing and getting better every day, then the expectation is my subordinates will do the same thing. So I don't know that it's hard leadership, but in the end, as long as you are, as a leader are demonstrating through your example and inspirational in your approach, I don't know that subordinates can have an excuse to say that you're being too hard. Uh, now, if you're asking them to attain a standard 
or attain perfection, uh, uh, then you might be going down the wrong road because your approach could be toxic. But if you are demonstrating your example, you're expecting us that the minimum standard, we are gonna meet that without a problem and we're gonna continue to strive for excellence, not perfection, then I think you have the right approach and that uh, in my 38 years of service, that's what subordinates and that's what young troops look for is that kind of inspirational kind of approach as a leader. Thank you for that perspective, sir. Going on that idea of growth, what is one piece of advice you would have given yourself as a young leader to grow in your character? Um, patience and tolerance. Tolerance in the aspect of not everyone will achieve the standard on their first try. I mean, we're human. We make mistakes. And as a young leader, I wish I would have been more patient in my approach and more tolerant to those that were struggling to meet standards. Now, in the end, uh, I felt I did a good job as a tactical level leader and an operational level leader in getting service members uh, to reach their untapped potential and to get to where they needed to be successful. But I think I could have been a bit, little bit more patient and a little bit more tolerant as a young leader. And I think uh, maturity uh, helps a lot in uh, getting after that. But I wish I could, if I could turn back the clock, that's what I wish I would, would have done better. Yes, sir. Uh, for many of our uh, future officers and newly commissioned officers in the audience, this member wants to know, as an enlisted member, what is some advice that you could give to a newly commissioned second lieutenant? Uh, first and foremost, when you show up to whatever your uh, job is, whatever your responsibility is, you own it when you get there. Whether you, whether you don't want to or not, you own it. Now, having said that, um, you're still a learning leader and you have to be a learning leader. Now, everybody has to be a learning leader throughout their career, but you certainly are now in your first duty station that you're a lieutenant and you're in charge. So you have to leverage the experience within your span of control or wherever you're working at. And that means those non-commissioned officers, the chief master sergeant, the senior master sergeant, the chief or the master or the uh, master sergeant, and certainly the mid-range leaders, the staff sergeants and the tech sergeants. You have to lean on them to help you in your growth and development. I will tell you this: the first officer in your chain of command will help you and assist you becoming a great officer. The senior non-commissioned officer in your span of control is going to help you be a be better leader. But in the end, you own it. So you can't come in and say, I'm going to be hands off and allow my non-commissioned officers or subordinates to run it. Because in the end, if something bad happens, that commanding officer or that officer in charge is going to come see you. So you own it. So you've got to take the ownership. But in the end, understand that you're still a learning leader. Learn from your non-commissioned officers and continue your growth and development. Thank you, sir. Do you have an example of how you have applied being best prepared for the worst day of your life outside of your professional duties? And how does your approach in such situations differ from applying it on the job or in combat? That's a phenomenal question. Um, I kept the same approach uh, as I had in the military, as I do in business now. And I try to be best prepared every day for what I have to do. For instance, this, this uh, you know, I was so honored that I was asked to be a part of this program. And I know that the minute I was asked that that came with responsibility on me, not only as a, you know, a former military person, but as a keynote speaker that I had to re re be responsible to be best prepared. And so I continued to work as I got ready to get up for this to make sure I was best prepared. I made sure when I came in that I wasn't uh, wearing retired attire, you know, that I looked the part. Um, and in the end, uh, much like I did on active duty, I want to, in business, I want to look, act, and perform like a professional. So I don't know that my approach has changed at all. Uh, certainly lessons learned along the way have assisted me in continuing to have this approach. 
but uh, I, I, I still try to keep the same approach uh, as I did when I was on active duty. We have time for one more question. So for the last question from the audience, in regards to having a service identity as the now second youngest military service in the US, how do you see the Air Force identity changing as the world changes faster every day? Well, I think the, the Air Force, uh, when we talk air power and the word power, that is gonna continue to be paramount as we move forward. As I mentioned before, you know, the Air Force was doing a lot of things and continues to do a lot of things in the defeat ISIS, the lasting defeat of ISIS campaign and everything. But it's uh, going after targets that are relatively uh, not opposing our aircraft and everything. But when you start talking about uh, a fight with uh, Russia or China or North Korea or Iran, now it's more air to air combat. It's certainly with Iran, and China and Russia, the uh, and North Korea, the surface to air threats will continue to uh, move forward. So I think what we have to continue to do is one, our modernization efforts have to continue to be on point so that our fighter and bomber aircraft are uh, provide us competitive advantages over any threat out there. And we continue to push forward with investing in our greatest uh, treasure and what I think is our greatest competitive advantage, and that's our people. And so our education, our training, and our experiences, we have to continue to make sure that there are, there are optimal opportunities for men and women to continue to grow and develop. Because in the end, that is our greatest advantage, is our people. So I, I foresee that the Air Force is going to continue and we'll, we'll have to be the number one air force in the world. We will con continue to show our allies and partners how we get after being best prepared. And we will continue to be there for those mutual defense agreements that we are part of uh, to support our NATO allies and certainly any of those other nations out there that are looking uh, to grab a partner. Because in the end, the number one partner in the world is the United States military. There's 196 countries in the world. The United States military is in 169 of them with a lot of those countries has, have a presence from our United States Air Force. And that's not gonna change in the future. And when I hear people talk about the United States is losing uh, their image with the, the rest of the world, I call BS on that. Because as I still go around and I still engage with our foreign partners, they are still looking for the United States to be the partner of choice so we can assist them in their deterrence efforts against the malign activities of a China or Russia or any of these other nations. So I think the Air Force is going to continue to be on point uh, and will have to be on point uh, and at the tip of the spear in defending our freedom in our nation. CX Troxel, thank you again for your time today. We appreciate your willingness to share your perspectives with us. Your unique background and experiences have enriched our view of warrior ethos and what it means to us as cadets and as future Air Force officers. As a token of our appreciation, a commemorative plaque is on its way to you. We hope you will remember your time with us as fondly as we will. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this NCLS session. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. God bless you all. Thanks.